welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 159th episode, our returning guest is Leon Nafok. You first heard Leon on episodes 101, 121, and 144 of the podcast. Leon Nafok is the co-creator of the Fiasco podcast and the president of Prologue Projects, a small podcast studio in Brooklyn. Previously, he hosted and co-produced Slow Burn at Slate. Nafok started his career in print journalism, writing for the New York Observer, the Boston Globe, and Slate. He is the author of The Next Next Level, a story of rap, friendship, and almost giving up. And now on to the show. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's always great to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so congratulations on the on the next season of uh, Fiasco here. I've only heard the first two, of course, but uh, it's already uh, very gripping and uh, very much in the spirit of your other podcasts. So. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Yeah. No problem, and uh, yeah, it was it was cool to get to hear it ahead of time, so everyone else be jealous that I've already uh, heard the second episode, <laughs> or at least the, the mix that was available at the time. I'm sure there's always edits going on or whatever, but um, but yeah, so the first one, the first one pretty much right, dropped uh, yesterday, right? Yeah, that's right, Thursday on uh, February 6th. Cool. Yeah, what's the response been like so far? Good. Um, I, uh, I I still need to send it to the folks we interviewed because um, a lot of times what, what happens is people we interview are a little older, and so explaining to them like how to get it and stuff is is, is harder than just sending them a file. So I still got to do that today. But um, seems like listeners like it. Um, I think it's, it's we we got a nice uh, I think assist from from current events in terms of it feeling really relevant. Uh, Obviously, we had a big presidential scandal uh, end in a certain way. I probably could make arguments that it didn't really end and it never really will, but uh, the uh, at least a phase of it ended uh, with the with the vote to acquit. And so here we come, uh, rushing into the vacuum with a with, a, with another White House scandal in case people are uh, feeling withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I always got like you kind of mentioned it in the first episode, but it's one of those scandals that I feel like everyone knows a little bit about, but no one knows. I feel like the whole story. I don't even claim to hold, know the whole story, obviously. And so it was fun to learn stuff uh, from you uh, through this. But is that kind of what you found that people know? They know Oliver North, and they know something about guns or missiles being traded, but that's about it, right? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's it's different in that way from uh, some of the past shows we've done. Most most of all, I think Watergate, uh, which sort of has a real uh, grip on the on the popular uh, consciousness. I feel like maybe because of All the President's Men, which was such a successful movie that everyone's seen, there's like a lot more conventional wisdom out there, or like common knowledge about Watergate than there is about Iran Contra. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were with with Watergate. We were we knew we were you know, operating within, uh, you know, a certain like constellation of touchstones that people are going to bring to the show. Like they would have, they would have known quite a bit, uh, about it going in and we needed to sort of meet them where they lived on some stuff, but then also surprise, you know, know how to surprise them. Um, I think a lot of what we do is like try to figure out kind of what, 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 what's the range of knowledge that listeners are going to bring to this and how can we, you know, optimize the script so that, um, you're not alienating people who already know the stuff you're presenting uh, or the people who, who don't know anything. So it's a kind of a, it's a tight rope in terms of what you're explaining, you know, at length, what you're kind of treating as novel, you know? And so uh, certainly with the Ron Contra, we just, we found pretty quickly after just like informally chatting with friends and, and uh, you know, just, just trying to sort of, ask around, well, you know, have you heard of this person? Have you heard of that person? Like, did you, do you understand this you know, aspects of the story. And by and large, you know, our finding was that people don't really know this, this scandal very well. Um, like you said, they might know Oliver North. They might have a vague sense that there was something involving hostages and weapons being traded. But, uh, you know, it's, it's such an unruly or rather an unwieldy scandal, you know, in part because you even, you see it right there in the name, Iran Contra. There's like this, you know, this dash in the middle that, that it's not clear what it's doing there. And if you don't know the story, it's kind of hard to, to, to know what is the what does Iran have to do with 
and what even is what even is the contra part? You know, it turns out, of course, that the contras were, uh, you know, anti-communist rebels in in, in Nicaragua and uh, in other parts of Central America who wanted to to, to overthrow uh, the Sandinista government. And so, you know, in the show, we kind of have to walk all that back and kind of tell the story from the beginning of like how we got to a point where um, there even was a rebel movement in Nicaragua, and how did that come about, and what did the U.S. have to do with it? So. You know, it's 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 a lot of it's a lot of uh, material, but I think we 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 feel pretty good about sort of how we pitched each you know each episode in terms of um, getting you know getting getting through to people who who are coming to this with with very little knowledge, but also not not you know making it boring for people who uh, who maybe know that know know a little more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you mentioned uh, current events, obviously, with Iran being uh, kind of fortu- for- fortuitous as far as people's interest <clears throat> in this type of thing. Uh, it was funny, I, when I was starting listening to these episodes, I saw a meme with somebody put, uh, it was a picture of Ronald Reagan in cowboy outfit, and the caption was, back in my day, we sold weapons to Iran. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it was like, it's, it's so it's so uh, different, you know, what the Republican Party did then and now. But anyway, um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it, it was interesting, the character sketch you draw of Ronald Reagan, who, you know, I was born in 83, so I don't have that much. I mean, I remember he was president for a little bit, but not in great detail but uh what what did you as far as the character of uh because obviously he's at the center of this but there's obviously other people in orbit around it but you, you kind of draw a kind of a, a sketch of somebody who isn't super informed about the details of things but if you give him a convincing story about something he'll kind of latch on to it and that kind of sounds like maybe what happened here so yeah i think he he um he was someone who really responded to individual uh, stories of, of, of hardship and plight, and you know, I think with other, you know, with other policies that he um, that he supported and, and, and promoted, I think uh, you know he, he was uh, his eyes would be open to sort of the, the possibility of suffering when it was directly in front of him, and so a lot of times during his first term after. This series of of, Ameri- of American kidnappings that happened in in, in Lebanon. Um, his aides knew that you know he would become really uh, obsessed with with getting these hostages home, uh, if only he was allowed to like really engage with their family members and their loved ones who were who were pushing for negotiation. And the feeling among his aides was like we can't let that happen because he's just his his judgment will be clouded, you know, essentially by his desire to to help these people. Um, you know, and that's uh, that's obviously a somewhat flattering portrayal, but I think as as the people we interviewed make clear, you know, it often got in the way of uh, a, a, you know a, a more clear-eyed uh, risk analysis, which I think is what happened with the arms for hostages um, deals. I think Reagan was just so focused on on getting these hostages home that he was willing to kind of cross lines and uh, you know violate his own his own policies towards Iran and uh, mm-hmm. towards the whole idea of negotiating with terrorists. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that's sort of what drove it forward. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of other factors, but, but I think that's a very powerful one. But I'm sure, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, the Iran hostage crisis that kind of preceded his election and, and inauguration, obviously that was a big victory for them. Uh, at least they felt that way at the time. But as you mentioned, that kind of set the precedent and kind of boxed them in as far as hostages going forward. You know, I'm sure in the short term, it seemed like a great, uh, you know, I guess unearned victory because what could could he have really done? He wasn't the president yet, and they were just trying to embarrass Jimmy Carter. It seemed like, but uh, now that he's kind of made his triumphant, you know, return of the hostages or whatever, now it's like, well, you've just set yourself up for the next one, you know. <laughs> so yeah, he definitely um he definitely made a made a big uh, you know big splash with with uh, with the return of the fifty some Americans who were who'd been held in Tehran for you know, very, very long time at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. I think there were people in his administration who, who one of whom we, we quote uh, in the show um, saying like, we, you know, we had this whole ceremony in the Rose Garden when the hostages came home and there was a, you know, a, a downside to that, which was that we made clear to everybody in the world that, you know, we, we, we are, uh, you know, we see the return of hostages as a, as a very big political victory and we're going to kind of, milk it for for everything it's worth 
um, which of course sends a signal, you know, to potential kidnappers that the, you know the Americans really take this hostage thing seriously, and who, you know, the, they're gonna it's gonna be very costly to them if it happens again, and you know, that obviously would give the kidnappers more leverage, and that's I think that's kind of what happened. Right. And, you know, I know we've mentioned this before, but it does, it is interesting how the characters and events from one, uh, you know, episode, we think of these as separate episodes like Watergate yeah. and Iran-Contra, but they're really not. I mean, that's just, the, there's, the past is never really the past, it seems like, because you have all these characters that keep popping up and, you know, they'll, they'll go away for a little while, but then they'll be back. You know, you mentioned uh, Henry Kissinger before and, and the general that you interviewed saying that he was kind of like a mentor. And then that made me think of, you know, Watergate. And then, of course, we had the thing with the hostages and Jimmy Carter, but Jimmy Carter was only there because of the rejection of Ford and Ford was rejected because he pardoned Nixon. And it's like everything is just one domino <laughs> follows the other. And it's it's never really just one story, is it? It's always just like, you know, and we're still talking about John Bolton. If you ever taught, <laughs> you ever wanted to blow my mind in like 2003, you go back and tell me then that John Bolton was a potential, you know, liberal hero, you know, in, in know. 2020, and that would it would blow some minds back then. But it's like you're it's just people just keep getting recycled over and over again. So I know, yeah, John 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 Bolton. I feel like has appeared in well, he was he he he, he had a little cameo in the 2000 election, which was the subject of our of our uh-huh. first uh, the fiasco. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of little cameos from people we've heard from before. Pat Buchanan shows up in the season. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> Chuck, uh, you mentioned Bolton, uh, one of the the OJ officials who was tasked with, uh, you know, doing sort of the first pass at a at a at a, at a um, fact finding mission in in the White House after the Iran weapons sales story broke, was uh, Chuck Cooper, who is now John Bolton's lawyer. Um, oh wow! So yeah, Washington Washington's a small town. People. People, people have a lot of lives, um, and with you know, with, with certain people, you know, I guess you can conclude that they're just attracted to, to scandal. Someone like Roger Stone, who we, uh, who, who, was, who also had a little cameo in the 2000 election story, uh, was obviously around for the Nixon administration. We actually interviewed him for uh, for the Slow Burn TV adaptation. He, he appears in in the in the new epic series, uh, talking about Watergate. Uh, oh wow! So yeah. There's a there's a cast of characters that that is recurring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, going back to that general, what was sorry, what was the general's name again that you interviewed? Are you talking about uh, Bud McFarlane? Yes. Um, yeah, but, that's another guy yeah, that was, you know. Was, I did. Was the general, but yeah. Oh, sorry. What was he? Um, let me look up his rank. Hold on. He's a retired Marine Corps officer. Oh, okay. He was, officer. Yeah. Um, but he, he seemed like he was pretty remorseful about everything. And, and, you know, I, he got like emotional near the end of your interview there. And, you know, that's, that's another case of you do a good job of finding these people who might not on first glance be worthy of empathy, but once you kind of dig down a little bit deeper, you know, everyone's human and we can all make that connection to, you know, feelings of regret. Obviously he wishes he had done more or something different. Uh, He takes a lot, a lot on himself and he feels like, you know, the buck stops with me and, I shouldn't have let this go on. So, you know, was that kind of a surprising, surprising thing? I mean, I guess you never know, really know when you start an interview if it's going to get to that. But, you know, is it surprising for you when you get those moments out of people like that? Um, so, so Bud McFarlane. So, just for context here, he was mm-hmm. he was the national security advisor under under Reagan, who um, sort of got the first like indication that there was interest on the part of the Iranians to. Mm-hmm. Uh, create some kind of opening to the U.S. Uh, this was obviously after the 1979 revolution, which uh, resulted in uh, the ouster of the Shah, who had been a U.S. allied uh, leader. Um, he was replaced by, you know, very hardline uh, Islamic, uh, you know, an Islamic, Islamic government, basically, but led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, and so the, the, the relationship between U.S. the U.S. and Iran was was, was very hostile. You know, those those, those hostages uh, that were taken did not did not help. Uh, there was an arms embargo. There was, uh, you know, the Iran had been had been uh, designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, but there was a hope on the part of Bud McFarlane and and others in in, in the administration that there was some way to at least lay the groundwork for a post Khomeini Iran. Um, and trading weapons for hostages was sort of a way to test the waters, I guess, and sort of signal to them that we were serious about uh, creating an opening and, and 
we would signal that op- signal that seriousness by sending them weapons, and they would signal their seriousness or their good faith by by helping us get these hostages back to Lebanon. Um, and so McFarland brought that idea to to Reagan after it came to him, and <clears throat> Reagan went for it because he wanted the hostages home. Um, pretty quickly, Bud McFarland decided that the initiative was a really, really bad idea. He'd always been, I think, skeptical of it, or at least was clear-eyed about the risks, but the risks became more obvious to him as, as time went on, and, and he, in the end, decided to end it, or try to end it, um, and and he wasn't able to. He, he he left the administration at the end of 1985, um, after which, you know, at which point there had already been two, two arms shipments uh, sent to Iran, um, and he left the administration sort of with the hope that that he had successfully, you know, brought the initiative to a close. But on some level, he sort of feared or even knew that that Reagan would would come back to it because of the again because of the hostages. And as you say, he got you know quite emotional in our interview. And I think the thing he he is at least the thing he said he's he's remorseful for and regretful for, about is the fact that he left the administration when he did and that he feels like if anyone you know could have stopped the Iran weapons program from continuing or from resuming it was him but he you know chose to leave and so he feels really really guilty about that um and i knew that you know i knew that he had taken this all very hard um you know we talk about this later in the season but actually like shortly before the congressional uh hearings began in in the in 1987 uh, McFarlane tried to take his own life, um, mm. and survived. Um, wow. so, and so, you know, we, we, we knew that he was, um, you know, someone with, with, with a lot to say about this, or at least had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of complicated emotions about it. And so, yeah, I wasn't like shocked when he, when he became pretty emotional during our interview, but it was still really striking to sort of see this person who, you know, was that, a very very high level of power in our in our government to sort of just sit in a room with him and watch him process this as a as a as a, as a man you know in his 80s who's looking back and and you know wondering what he did wrong or what he could have done better or differently and I don't know it was as you say like it's uh it, it's it becomes becomes easy to really empathize with someone when you you're sitting in a room with them. Um, mm-hmm. that, that definitely happened with the Farland for sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, now with the other, you know, uh, stories that you've covered, they've been more political stories. And obviously this is a political story. It has a lot to do with that, but there's also kind of a undercurrent of, you know, the, you know, the intelligence agencies and CIA and more covert stuff that, that goes a little bit beyond just domestic politics. So, um, how did you approach that? Did you approach anyone at like, say the CIA, for example, or any of these other agencies to try to get their side of it? I mean, I know it's been a long time since all this happened, but you know, it's, it's still kind of a big, you know, (laughs) it's a big deal. So. Wait, sorry. Well, your, your question is, is, um, whether we tried to yeah, did you talk? Did you talk to the C? Did you get to go to like CIA media and be like, "Hey, can I talk to somebody from the CIA?" You know? No, no, we didn't. We didn't do that. Okay. I mean, we, we 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 did everything we could to you know talk to people who, who supported these policies and who uh-huh. were the architects of them and got their perspective uh, yeah. and made sure we understood why they did what they did. But I don't know. I'm not sure what the what the official CIA press office could really contribute to this. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, probably a big no comment on that one. But uh, yeah, so obviously I've heard two of the, the, there's eight again, right? This is the. Yeah, uh, there's eight. eight. eight Okay. How far are you through making the rest of the six of them here? Uh, We are quite close, actually. We, um, we are, we are further along uh, on the remaining episodes than we ever have been on previous seasons, uh, Mm. which was good. Um, Sort of have a system in place now that uh, is working pretty efficiently. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're still working on, you know, the last three episodes, um, but they're, far, they're, you know, they're far along and we're not killing ourselves to, to, to hit that finish line. Um, you know, we're still doing interviews for the last couple episodes and, and, but we know what they're about and we know, you know, we have outlines and we have a lot of archival audio already pulled and we're in, we're in good shape. 
Well, that's good. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how far you go because obviously you only have eight, eight episodes. That's kind of your your formula there. Is you always seem to do the eight, uh, and there's always more to say as we've talked about before. But uh, are you going to get into the CIA Contra crack uh, story that has been told uh, in different different ways over the years? Obviously. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question, and it's a hard. It's, it was a hard thing to um, to find space for for a pretty interesting reason, I think, which is that you know, as we were saying before, there's only a couple of things people really know about Iran Contra if you're just to pull you know a random room, and actually one of them is is the the thing you just referred to, the sort of like reports of CIA complicity and drug smuggling by the Contras. Uh, there were noises being made about that, like in 86, 87, um, you know, in fact, John Kerry uh, oversaw mm-hmm. a committee investigation to look into the, the allegations. And he put out a report and it was, you know, didn't go so far as to say the CIA, you know, did this on purpose or, or you know, uh, I think, you know, I think the, 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 the sort of most, the most um, aggressive form of the allegation, right, is that the CIA likes to deliberately put crack in, into African-American, you know, communities, you know, out of, out of racial malice. And I think uh, that is not borne out, I think, by any, by any evidence, but there, there is plenty of evidence, surely, that um, there was drug smuggling going on. And I think there are questions about how much the CIA knew about it. Um, but the reason it was hard to incorporate into the series, and we do address it, but maybe not in the way, like, that we might otherwise, the reason it was hard is that it wasn't really until 1996 that people really um, started talking about the drug smuggling thing a lot. Like I said, there were, there were like, there were some, you know, there were some reports about it in the, in the late eighties, but like a lot of things about Iran Contra that didn't really stick. Um, and so it wasn't until 96 when a uh, reporter named Gary Webb, uh, writing mm-hmm. for the San Jose Mercury News, um, wrote, you know, a series of articles in which he really made the kind of pretty direct connection between the, the drug smuggling that he that he was reporting on in, in Central America and uh, the crack epidemic. And he, he really kind of brought the story home by, you know, saying to American readers, like, this thing that you maybe felt like was happening far off in a different country that doesn't have anything to do with you. In fact, you know, you look at in, into the into American cities and you see the effects of it. Um, I think kind of uh, soldering on that domestic connection really elevated the claim and, and made it more um, interesting to Americans. And I think it really spread like wildfire. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, we try to keep things pretty chronological on our show. Um, and so we didn't want to spring back or spring forward in 96. Uh, 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 you know, it was just would have been from a narrative perspective it would have been hard. Like we get, we, we make, we make it into the early nineties. We make it into the Clinton administration because the office of the independent council by uh, led by Lawrence Walsh actually was up and running, you know, through the beginning of 93. Um, mm-hmm. It was a very long investigation. Um, and obviously the, you know, the many of the defendants that, that the OIC had, had uh, convicted uh, or were, or was about to try um, were pardoned by George H. W. Bush at the end of his uh, at the end of his uh, at the end of his term. So we we covered that, but um, we decided to to handle the drug smuggling stuff in a slightly different way. Um, we uh, well, I don't want to say much about it now, but we we have we have a we have an idea for how to for how to address it that's not going to sort of be in our normal in our normal mode. Um, yeah, it's certainly interesting, but it's, it, it was just hard to kind of. Uh, find a place for it in the narrative no it's it's one of those stories that's a, definitely a rabbit hole because I've, I've read uh dark alliance by gary webb i've interviewed freeway ricky ross i've interviewed mark levin who directed freeway crack in the system the documentary about it and it's just one of those stories that you pull one thread and you just keep going and going so i i totally understand why you wouldn't want to uh you know get into that because you're in for a penny you're in for a pound you know you <laughs> you start you start telling that story you're gonna eight episodes isn't gonna cover it if you're trying to tell this and everything else leading up to it so it's like that could be its own whole thing so it's it seems like a can of worms to to get into that kind of stuff so I can totally yeah, I think, and I, and I think I think there's like we just sort of knew there wasn't going to be like a clear answer at the end because mm-hmm. you know no one's been able to really like I think no one's been able to really come up with a, with a satisfying um, 
case, you know, like it happened one way and not the other way. And so that's always dangerous, you know, when you, when you can't even see around, you know, see the end of the tunnel when you, when you go down a hole like that. Hell, so yeah. I don't know, I'm hoping that our, that our approach to handling it will, uh, will work and that listeners will feel informed about that aspect of the story without, um, you know, giving, without getting, without us giving it sort of the full fiasco treatment. Right, right. Well, and you do, uh, you know, you you posted the link to this, but you have like a bibliography of sources that you use for yeah. your research. So if people want to go deeper, there's definitely that uh, available to them. It's it's like, you, I don't expect you to cover every aspect of every scandal, but, you know, it's it does kind of set the ball rolling if you if you talk about this, this, and this is how we got here. And you can follow along, too, if you want to. So I think that's helpful. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we're doing the bibliography. I mean, we all, we've always done bibliographies. The thing we changed this this season is that we actually put out a we put put a little um, I don't know what you call it, like a stinger or a billboard at the top of every episode saying here, you know, if you want to see our sources for this episode, like go to this link or go to the link in the show notes. We put that up right up, right up front because I think you know there's a conversation uh, happening right now in, in podcasting and in, in journalistic podcasting about. Uh, attribution and, and you know people not citing their facts and, and people mm-hmm. committing, pl- committing plagiarism um, and we just wanted to be really uh, you know upfront about where we are getting our information and you know, with a podcast it's, it's hard to stop every after every fact and say according to this book according to this article according to you know this report um, it just makes it really hard to, to follow the story or, or, or tell a you know t- you know to tell the story without interrupting yourself all the time and so there's that there's that kind of uh obstacle in terms of citing your sources on a podcast um but our hope is that you know by by, by offering listeners like a, a comprehensive list of sources um and flagging that at the top of every episode we, we were sort of doing our best to to give credit where it's due and and make sure that people know like where we're getting our information Right, right. And I think what you were alluding to is the uh, Crime Junkie podcast, which is actually produced here in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, oh, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, two women that they go over different crimes that are unsolved. And uh, it's, it's an interesting show. I've, I've never really listened to it, but I've read about it a bunch. And, and it, it is interesting. But there has been journalists that have felt, you know, they've kind of taken their work and not uh, attributed it. Um, I think I think the thing with them, though, is that they pick such specific kind of maybe unknown cases to most people that it could only really be from one source that they got all this information. Uh, Whereas I feel like what you're doing is I'm glad you're being, you know, astute and, you know, trying to make sure you cross all your T's and dot all your I's and make sure you're not trying to say you did this original reporting when you didn't. But I feel like the things you pick are so well trod that it's like, I mean, (laughs) no one really expects you to like, you know, annotate every single fact that's in the public record that, you know, everyone should know, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I feel like you're a little bit more in the clear than, than others, but yeah, but you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, like the details we use or the, the, you know, quotes we, 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 um, we cite in the, in the show, like are, are from one place, you know, like Uh they were the result of someone digging. And so, um, you know, we just want to make sure that we're, we're buttoning ourselves up and, and saying, you know, not, not acting like we're the people we, we, we discovered around Contra. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would that would be a little disingenuous um but uh how are how do uh presidential libraries figure into this because obviously that's got to be a treasure trove of like original source material but you know you might be you know you are telling some unflattering stories about these different presidents so how have you know the different presidential libraries or or places that you've dealt with that have to do with kind of maintaining the reputation of these leaders you know even after they're dead you know how, how have they dealt with your requests or the stories that you've told about these presidents here uh, well, so the Reagan Presidential Library, um, there's like a, there's a website that they have, uh, I think mm-hmm. it's their website that, um, but they have all, like all of his speeches and they're, you know, they're a really, really well organized archive. Um, but, uh, you know, I think presidential libraries are interesting. Like they, they, they're run by people who are, who obviously have a special interest in the candidate in, in not the candidate in the president that they're devoted to. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the, there's also an understanding that, you know, presidency is not all, not all to be celebrated. And so you get, you get different, um, different kinds of presidential libraries. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of, 
uh, specific experiences to, to tell you about on on the Reagan Library. Um, but uh, I can tell you that the that the material is very well organized. Well, that's good. It didn't burn down. I guess that was in danger for a minute. So. Yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, this might be a little early to ask, but are there any uh, special guests you could tell us about that are coming? You probably can't, right? <laughs> You're tease oh, it. No, I'm happy to. I mean, we, the, the, you know, we, we were very lucky to get access to, to people who were very close to the story. I mean, Bud McFarlane, we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, John Poindexter, who, who replaced McFarlane as uh, national security advisor starting nice. in, at, the late, at the end of 85. We spoke to him at length. Um, we spoke to Richard Secord, who was a retired Air Force uh, Major General, who um, he was uh, sort of had his good career in government cut short uh, because of a scandal involving one of his associates uh, who'd been selling uh, explosives to uh, Gaddafi. Um, and, and that scandal kind of tarnished uh, uh, this Air Force General's name a little bit, and he was, he was at, kind of chased out of government. Um, his name is Richard Secord, and he ended up being really important because he was sort of like the private uh, private citizen who was kind of put in charge of, um, you know, handling logistics for uh, the Iran weapon sales and also handling logistics for the, uh, the Contra resupply operation, which is what, you know, they were trying to, um, you know, get guns and, and, and uh, food and other, you know, supplies to the Contras who were in, in the jungles in Nicaragua. And so Secord ended up being kind of in charge of the logistics on both of these operations. Um, and the fact that they were using a private citizen was sort of key to the, to the plan, right? Because it gave them a little bit of deniability about what they were doing. Um, and so we got to talk to him. Um, we got to talk to Secretary of State George Schultz, uh, who was 98 years old. And we, when we talked to him, mm. uh, talked to Congressman Lee Hamilton, who was a uh, you know, really important figure in the, in the congressional investigations. Oh, wow. um, yeah, we got, we got a lot of good access. Um, I think uh, I think even people who are experts on on this story will 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 find those interviews uh, pretty revealing and 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 new, uh, despite the mm -hmm. fact that you know, these guys have have talked about this stuff before. They've written books about it, um, you know. But I think hearing from them and you know with with, all, with this with this buffer of thirty some years or twenty some years, um, no, thirty some years <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. from the, from the events of Grand Contra, it's, it, you're still going to sh shake loose some new some new thoughts and new feelings, um, some new information possibly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were very lucky to get that access. Yeah, it's interesting to hear when you interview these people that, you know, obviously you're talking to them for a reason that has to do with the story that you're covering. But I know just from hearing them and reading them elsewhere that, like, there's so much else you could ask them about, about so many other things and literally just never run out of questions. Like, you you interviewed Jane Mayer. How many stories and books has she written about, like, totally interesting and amazing events and like i could just sit there and ask her about any number of things and of course you're talking to her for this because she has something to say but i'm like oh man I'd, I'd love to ask you like like anita hill questions i'd love to ask you like you know kavanaugh questions i'd love to harvey weinstein you know like go down the list of all the stories that she's you know kind of covered over the years and it's like man she's just a treasure trove and every single one of these people i'm sure is the same way so <laughs> yeah for sure i mean we have to be very targeted about our interviews, we have to make sure that we're going in, you know, with a pretty clear idea of what we want to, 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 to talk about, because, um, again, even if you were to just limit it to Iran Contra, there's a million things you could talk about and a million different little subplots you could explore. Um, you know, one of the reasons we're sort of on schedule for this, for the production process here is that we, we made a point of kind of trying to really outline our episodes before we were talking to people so that we knew kind of what, what, what we wanted to ask them and make to make sure that we were doing you know as efficient a job as possible with those interviews because you know a lot of these people are also really busy i mean jane mayer's got a lot going on and so you know we don't want to take so much of her time that that it becomes a burden to her um but we also want to make sure we we cover what we want to cover and so she was very generous with her time and um she shows up in a number of episodes actually because she, she and she she wrote a great book with uh with a fellow journalist named doyle mcmanus who's also on the show um, she and Jane, Jane Mayer and Doyle McManus, uh, co-wrote a book called Lamb's Lives that I, I would recommend mm -hmm. to anyone. They were trying to start, you know, reading about Iran Contra. I feel like that book is the place to start because it really lays out the story in a very, um, kind of clear way that's, that, that reads kind of like a thriller. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, a 
lot of weeds you could get into, um, and mm-hmm. they certainly get into a lot of them, but they do they do it in a really skillful way that doesn't you know it doesn't feel like too much. And uh, for that reason, I think their book is like a great starting point for anyone. Cool. After yeah. our podcast, of course. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't don't start till after. Um, but uh, as far as like the extra stuff, I know that you had extra kind of bonus clip type interviews in the past. Is that something you're going to continue with this season? Yeah, for sure. Um, we have, you know, there's always more interviews. There's always more interviews in our in our hopper that we than we've been were able to use, and uh, we we always you know look for stuff that is interesting but doesn't necessarily have a, have a, a natural place in our in our outline. Mm-hmm. In our, in our in our series outline so we definitely um we definitely keep that in mind as we're working and was like oh yeah, yeah that might be a good bonus episode and so we have mm-hmm. we have a couple of those uh for sure coming up right right airs. well and you mentioned uh the tv show aspect uh is that are you still involved with that even though you're not doing slow burn anymore yeah yeah so i'm i'm the narrator of the, of the tv show the tv show is uh an adaptation of season one of slow burn so it's about watergate which Season I, I started with, and uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a executive producer on the show, and oh, was cool. involved in the script, in the scripting, and the you know, and the and the and the editing and stuff, and so and then the narrator that uh, that you hear throughout the show, uh, and actually that you see throughout uh, at the beginning of every episode, I, I you, you get to see my little face um, for about a minute and a half. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was uh, definitely involved, and I'm very proud of the show, uh, Left Right, which is a production company that that. Uh, worked on it. They did an amazing job um, of really pushing past what we had already achieved with the podcast and, and kind of embracing what was good about it while expanding it um, and, and you know introducing interviews that we didn't have and introducing a lot of visual archival material that we obviously didn't have. Mm. Um, so I'm excited for people to see it. I think I think even people who heard the podcast and remember it pretty well are going to find something to like about it. Right. You didn't have to like interview the same people over again and get them to say on camera what they told you into a recorder, right? I mean, you, you covered the ground were, and stuff. There were people who, um, there were people definitely who who were interviewed uh, for the TV show who we had spoken to mm. for the podcast. Um, but yeah, they, they they had to do the interviews again because uh, they wanted okay. <laughs> camera, obviously. Yeah, couldn't do it animation, I guess, or something. But that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, cool. What did you uh, did you get a chance to listen to the Biggie and Tupac season of Slow Burn? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah what do you think? Uh, I hope they did a great job. Yeah, um, you know, I, thought it, I thought it was good. That was a cool, cool move to go in a different direction. Um, I thought, uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's uh, it's like uh, it's a weird feeling to to have something you know that you yeah. that you think of as, as your own uh be you know uh carried on with, without you but uh you know we're all we're all adults uh yeah. Yeah, it was it was, it was it, it's cool i'm glad it's, I'm glad it's out there i forget the host's name now but he was just like i'm so and so and i'm the host of slow burn and in my mind i was like no you're not <laughs> i know the host of slow burn no, i'm kidding <laughs> i liked it i liked it it was good but um yeah so uh, next season of fiasco what is it tell me i'm sure you thought about it yeah no we're already working on it i'm actually i'm not supposed to say yet what it's about but really um, wow yeah I'll keep, it, keep it to myself for now but um but it's 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 going to be good and it's going to be different than, than anything we've done so far and I'm really, really excited about it. I think it's it's, it's gonna it's gonna push us to kind of tell a different kind of story um, mm-hmm. than maybe people are expecting from us. It's still it's still about politics and history. I can tell you that, but um, you know, it's 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 not about a presidential scandal. Let's, let's leave mm-hmm. it there. And uh, I think you've achieved some sort of immortality now because you've been uh, parodied by the Onion, right? So yeah, we got par- we got parodied by the Onion, man. We got parodied by the Daily Show. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I, I can I can I can die now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all over. Close up shop. Nothing better can happen. <laughs> um, oh, one thing I wanted to mention is at the end of episode one, uh, I laughed out loud in my car listening to the anti-communist uh, jingle you had there at the end. Where did you ever find so, that music? That so was amazing, hilarious. right? <laughs> I'm not the one who found that, uh, but I'm so glad that one of one of my colleagues did. It's such an amazing um, song. Um, if you want, if you want, if you want to play it, and oh, actually, I don't know if you can play it since we licensed it, but uh, people can hear it at the end of the episode. Um, yeah, it's just like just this beautiful like ballad, but sung by this woman with an angelic voice about how communism is the devil. Yeah. It's really jarring once you realize what she's singing about. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, because you don't realize for the first few seconds what's going on, and then she gets to it, and I'm like, oh man, we're going there. All right, <laughs> interesting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> don't hear many pop songs to, about that these days, but uh. <laughs> exactly, so uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's most of everything I wanted to cover. Is there any any uh, music you want to recommend that you've been listening to lately besides the anti-communist jingle, of course? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've been I've been bad about music lately. I've I've like I've, I I there was there I go through periods of time when I'm really like clued into what's what's happening, but um sometimes I, I I peel off and and don't um don't pay as close attention. I've been I've been listening to the Lil Wayne album that just came out. It's really good. Um, yeah, the last person I had yeah, on the podcast told me about that too. I'm gonna have to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah, he really you know he's he he's someone who had like a really kind of like immortal run for, for mm-hmm. a couple of years in the 2000s who has stayed on the scene and has stayed, you know, continued making music, but um, for whatever reason, haven't quite hit the, hit the highs that he, that he hit uh, at his peak. But um, this album is, is a uh, cut above and uh, really feels like kind of a return to form. Um, well, that's, so that's cool good. That. Yeah. Well, I was super into the dedication album, you know, mixtape series, of course. And that was, I think the time you're referring to when he was probably yeah, at his exactly. hottest. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I kind of felt like it was diminishing returns there for a while after the, you know, after the first couple dedications and then it was like dedication six. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> 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 I don't know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's fun. It's good to hear. And also I heard, you know, Eminem might be back too. So with his new album, I haven't listened to that one either, but you know, I, I was uh, an angry That's young good. child from the Midwest uh, at the right time for that. So <laughs> be interesting so to get back I, into I, that as I, well. So. I'm a big Eminem apologist. I still listen to Encore, which is considered like a bad album by 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 even his fans, but and by him, really? and he, I like he that. It is a bad album. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I love Encore, uh, and uh, I uh, but I can't, I can't, I can't do this new shit. I just can't. <laughs> Not into it. <laughs> can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, no, it, it's after I first talked to you the first time, uh, you had mentioned the Migos, and obviously you'd done a, a profile of them kind of earlier in yeah. your career. Uh, I just kind of got up with them lately, and I'm like, man, I always dismissed it because I had always just heard Bad and Bougie, but I w- went back and listened to a lot of it. I'm like, okay, I dismissed this, and I shouldn't have because they're really doing doing something interesting here. And now it's like they basically brought the entire game along with them, and it's like they were doing something so out of the box originally but now it's like you can't find anybody who isn't like at least imitating them a little bit so that's that's been interesting totally. to see over the last few years so for sure yeah they're uh they they have their mortality as well for sure oh yeah absolutely just do the ad libs after every line it's it's wonderful yeah. so, <laughs> but uh well great well uh, hey thanks for taking so much time i know you're super busy i can't wait to hear no, it's more. my pleasure I, 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 yeah. i'm very grateful to you for uh for, for sticking with us and being into the into the into the podcast and i hope your listeners check it out yeah absolutely well you definitely cover a lot of my interest areas pretty pretty thoroughly so i i will definitely be listening and watching for whatever else uh, you do so uh yeah keep it coming and keep up the good work and uh yeah don't don't burn oh. yourself out so <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks rob i really appreciate your time uh have a good one you too bye-bye all right take care
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.